Welcome. I'm recording on Saturday, and the rain on the roof is just such a wonderfully calming sound. It's one of those soup rainy days. And today, our soup with seniors sent stew to a number of our shut ins, a gift from the church. I want to thank all those who were part of the, the stew a week or so ago. It was a magnificent experience. I've heard, though I cannot eat it, that the stew is fabulous. And what a wonderful gift on this rainy day of the warmth of our love and the goodness of the stew. And so with that, I hope these words of scripture from Matthew chapter five will be comforting, will be like the sound of rain on the roof. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went to the mountain, and there he sat down. The disciples came to him, and he began to speak, teaching them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we focus on Blessed are those who mourn. You know, there's no playbook for grief, no four-step process to move past it. And everyone grieves their own way. Wisdom tells us that grief is not like last year, gone in the past. We learn to live as our grief morphs over time. Indeed, grief and mourning are not exactly the same though we use them as synonyms. The truth is, is many people are uncomfortable around grief and grieving moments. They just don't know what to say. Too often, people try to fill the silence and the words they use do not help. Can you think of things that people say or, or do in times of grief that are the opposite of comfort? If you haven't learned already, Steel Magnolias, the movie, is one of my go-tos for sermon illustrations. In the movie, there's an iconic scene in the cemetery. Malin Eatonton, played by Sally Field, is standing alone, silent by the casket of her daughter, Shelby, after the service is concluded and the people have departed. Her dearest friends come close to be with Malin. They comment about the beauty of the service and the flowers. Then Truby, played by Dolly Parton, asks the question gently, how are you doing? How are you holding up? Malin offers an obligatory deflection, I'm fine. We all know that's not true. The newly converted young evangelical Anel, played by Daryl Hannah, attempts to fill the awkward moment by the casket with words of comfort. It should make you feel a lot better that Shelby is with her king. Malin curtly deflects this inattentive comment. Well, I guess it should. Then Anel doubles down. We should all be rejoicing. That sets off the best response to the platitudes people offer that ignore or deny the pain of grief. Malin makes it clear in this moment of grief, maybe I am selfish, but I'd rather have her here with me. And now, like so many of us, just can't make sense of the good dying young. Malin expresses the reality of grief. My mind tells me Shelby would not want me to get mired down and wallow in this. Just do the best I can and put one foot in front of the other and go on. My mind keeps telling me that. I wish someone could tell my heart. 
There it is. We grieve with mind and heart. And many times in our life, our mind and heart are not always together. Malin goes on to express her anger at how unfair life is that her daughter died young, leaving behind a two-year-old son who would never know how wonderful his mother was. She cries out to God, why? Why? I want to understand why. Malin is so angry. She just wants to slap someone so they will feel as bad as she does. That someone is God. Malin, like many of us, in times of death, are angry at God. Clary, played by Olympia Dukakis, breaks the tension by grabbing Weezer Bedreau, played by Shelley McLean, offering the famous line of this movie, here, slap Weezer, knock her lights out. Half a chickapoo parish would give their eye teeth to take a whack at Weezer. This totally off-the-cuff idea breaks the tension with laughter to everyone. Even Malin busts out in laughter. Laughter through tears may be indeed one of the best emotions. In a very strange way, by becoming the butt of the humor, Weezer bore some of Malin's grief. We bear others' grief by taking food, sitting quietly just to be present, greeting the throngs of visitors who come to our friend's home, writing down the gifts of food that they bring, and sometimes politely telling the person at the door, not now. Maybe later, they need a break. People serve in these moments like shepherds, tending the grieving with their service. In doing so, they bear the burden of grief with love. There is a good grief that neither ignores nor magnifies the grief. Like any wound, it is tended some days are better than others. Some days we feel like we have regressed back and to a place we thought we'd left behind. Living in the presence of grief and not allowing grief to become the enemy or the dictator of our life, that is good grief. For we move forward to live with grief, not in spite of it. Good grief means we will laugh and we will cry and we will enjoy the simple pleasures like a beautiful sunset again. And yes, we get surprised by unexpected moments of tears. Months later, years later, good grief means we are alive, in touch with our humanity, and in this moment not paralyzed by the past. Not only do we mourn for our loved ones? Are we today in disbelief, sorrow, even mourning for the new war in Gaza? Targeting children is horrific. Putin did it in Ukraine and now we see it as the new tactic of Hamas. For children, young people at a music concert, civilians and the elderly are being harmed intentionally and unintentionally by the sin of war. Can we grieve the loss of a friendship? Mourn the loss of joy and closeness that is now replaced by an icy, silent emptiness? Ever felt deep regret, remorse, even mourning for something you said? Wished you could take it back? Regret, have you ever regretted a decision or an action? Wished it had never happened at all. Jesus was not only talking about comforting grief from a death, but also grief that comes from our mistakes, our sins that feel like death. For instance, a person's marital infidelity is not just a sin against the spouse. 
It's also a betrayal of the children of that marriage. Betrayal of our family connections, of trusted friends. And when trust is broken and hearts are shattered by grief, it's like a death. A death of relationships that may never quite be the same ever again. Have we ever thought of our sins against God as infidelity? Other gods are not just a religion. It's leaving God out of the equation of our lives. Chasing after the symbols of success in our world at the expense of the relationships that truly make us rich. Our family, our friends, and of course our God. Mourning is not for the proud. Poverty of spirit, as we learned last week, is humility to recognize our absolute need for God in every corner, in every phrase, in every moment of our lives. We cannot mourn our sin while presuming our relationship with God. Humility always precedes the mourning that leads to genuine repentance. In that way, the Beatitudes become like a, a ladder the first step is always humility that embraces our complete dependence on God. In Matthew 6, 25 through 33 in the Sermon on the Mount, consider the lilies of the field. They neither spin nor toil. Yet I tell you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So if God cares for the grasses, that today are blooming and tomorrow in the fire. Will God not care more for you? Consider the birds of the air. They do not collect in barns. They do not sow. They do not harvest. And I tell you that the Father prepares for them their food. If God cares for them and knows every sparrow that falls, does God not care for you? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches you. That's why mourning can happen with health. Because we know our good grief comes from a God who loves us and cares for us, who always has God's eye on us, and God has no desire to humiliate us or push us down or beat us up for our mistakes and sins. How is sin overcome? How does mourning our sin make it right? We all know the formula. It's not that hard. Yeah, it is that hard. If it wasn't hard, it would, everyone would do it. Repent, have a change of heart, a change of action. Seek forgiveness and forgive. And in that place of repentance and forgiveness, the healing of reconciliation that brings you back together again. So Jesus goes on to explain this more in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. You've heard it said in ancient times, you shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to the judgment. But I say to you, if you're angry with your brothers or sisters, you will be liable. And if you bring your altar before God, your offering to the altar before God, and you recognize that your brother or sister has something against you, go to them first, leaving your offering at the altar and reconcile with your brother or your sister before you come to make your offering to God. Wow. Jesus says anger is a form of murder. Anger is the punishment we give ourselves. It raises our blood pressure. It stresses our heart. It shortens our lives. Anger can do the same to our brothers and sisters. You see, what Jesus is asking for is the kind of Mourning and repentance that honestly states what we have done, 
owns our part and desires their healing. And we're not there to justify ourselves or make us feel better. We're there to heal the harm we have done. This can only happen through humility and mourning that accepts our part and makes us willing to do whatever is necessary to heal and reconcile. That's how those who mourn are comforted. Jesus goes on to say that anger on steroids is retaliation. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if he strikes you on the right cheek, turn again the other. If he asks for your shirt, give him also your coat. Wow. Jesus is not saying be abused. He's saying be unwilling to escalate. Rather create space for the healing of anger. War is retaliation on steroids. And retaliation is anger on steroids. And anger is a form of murder. So when the goal is eye for eye and a tooth for a tooth, the outcome is always a blind and toothless population. This is not an encouragement to fight back. It is limiting what we seek to the level of the harm. No more than an eye, no more than a tooth. Imagine if we were willing to give whatever it takes to replace what we've broken with our sin. I was asked this week in a public forum a very uncomfortable question about the current war in Gaza. Boy, when you answer questions about war, particularly this war, this kind of war, people listen. Some want to hear what they believe. Some want to hear... And so I began my response this way. Acknowledge that my first response to the atrocities was anger. That anger overtook any mourning in my life for what was going on. How often do we see retaliation rather than reconciliation? This is one of those moments. Second, I went on to recognize that we as United Methodists have been through a war and are still in the mopping up of a war that has left United Methodist children orphaned with no church home. I hear those stories in the chaplaincy work that I do. It is painful. The broken relationships where people living in the same community can't worship under the same roof, can't have healthy conversations. You see, my third response was, war is a multi-leveled demon monster. Too big for any one of us to handle. But if we want peace on earth, it begins with me and my own relationships. Got to deal with the board in my eye before I speak about the board in the eye of this war. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. That is what's at stake in this morning. So we can mourn for the brokenness in our world, in the United Methodist Church, in our community, in our families, and our own church. Mourn enough to look inside first. Mourn enough to deal with our part first. This love your enemies that Jesus offers is tough. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you, that you might be called children of God. Wow. You know, there are a lot of people who will say they take scripture literally. This passage never seems to come up. 
In a time of war, we can justify ignoring what Jesus said and explaining it away with our anger, with our sense of retaliation. But as children of God, we have to deal with these words honestly. True mourning recognizes there's a war within us towards our enemies so that we don't see them as children of God or persons of sacred worth or our brother or sister. The depth of mourning here that Jesus demands of disciples is to see even those who do harm to us as God's children, our family. Will mourning undo the harm? No. Will it disrupt the progression of harm to wound, to infection, to abscess, to amputation? Yes. Like any other large healing, it will take a willingness to take the medicine. Repentance. Kind of tastes like castor oil. To do the rehab, the hard work of reconciliation, and to stay with it over time until forgiveness is the word of the day. Comfort that Jesus offers is in the process so that the past no longer determines the future. So we are present with the harm, present with the hurt, present with the cleansing, present with the repentance, present with the reconciliation, and present with the healing. Yes, this is not instantaneous comfort. It is the comfort of doing the work of being human in the way Jesus was human, redeemed humans in the likeness of Christ. Did Jesus say this process would be painless? No. Did he say this process would be easy? No. This is what he said. When we do the work of mourning that leads to owning our sin, repenting of our sin, turning our lives in a new direction, seeking forgiveness, seeking reconciliation, seeking to heal the wound, when we do that work, we will be comforted. That's the promise. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. For the process is always healing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. May your mourning lead to laughter through tears.